Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Kate Olva, Executive Director for Women in Identity. I am joined here today with Kay Shogard. She is our U.S. Ambassador for Women in Identity, and Melissa Carvalho, who is our Canadian Ambassador for Women in Identity. So we're going to talk to you a little bit today about women in identity, who we are and what we do. Um, and we're going to then go into our code of conduct research, talking about uh, the human impact of identity exclusion. Um, up until this point, that's what the code of conduct research has been focused on and what it actually means for people who are excluded from identity um, and how that impacts their daily lives and their ability to participate in society. And then we'll talk about next steps and how you all can get involved. So women in identity, uh, we drive the digital identity industry to build solutions with diverse teams to promote universal access, which enables civic, social, and economic empowerment around the world. We're driving the industry to build those diverse teams so that we ensure that digital identity solutions are built for all, by all. <laughs> Thank you. So sorry. Okay. <laughs> Did I switch too soon? Do you need to go back? Okay, sorry. Um, and I'll just talk briefly about our values. We are committed to diversity and inclusion, catalyst for change, solution-oriented, and a force for good. And most importantly, we are a team. Um, Women in Identity is majorly volunteer-run. It is an amazing community of volunteers. Kay and Melissa are two of our volunteers. Um, we have our events lead in the crowd, and another volunteer, Roland, who's here with us. Um, so it's a really great community, um, and we'll talk more about how you can get involved in that later on. Okay. And our strategic goals. So at the end of 2021, uh, Women in Identity went through a comprehensive and inclusive strategy review. And from that, we came um, out with six strategic goals that are listed here to increase diversity in the industry through thought leadership, to increase awareness of the issues that digital identity inclusion, exclusion, I'm sorry, it causes for society and individuals, to increase inclusivity by improving product design of digital identity solutions, to become the go-to organization to help with digital identity policy development in respect of inclusion, to be seen as the thought leaders of digital identity inclusion, making a positive change for society, and to be a sustainable not-for-profit organization raising funds through sponsorship. And you'll see that there's a lot of overlap there with those um, goals, Oops. whether it be product design, inclusion. Okay, <laughs> my timing is terrible, sorry. Um, and we are funded by sponsorships. Uh, membership in Women Identity is completely free, open to all. It is inclusive across uh, gender, you know, all diversity, right? Not just gender. So Women in Identity, even though it's women, it is not, um, you know, we welcome men and everybody else to be a part of it. Um, so our sponsors, we are so thankful for them. Without their generous contributions, we wouldn't be able to continue to do the work that we do and to achieve that vision of for all, by all. Okay, and so now we're gonna move on to the Code of Conduct Research Work. Well, thanks, sorry. I hope I do a better job with this than I'm doing with the clicker, so sorry. I volunteered and already I'm falling down on the job. So, um, so yes, um, I'm Kay Chopard, as, as Kate said, and the code of conduct is kind of a labor of love, if I can put it that way. It's, it's something where, as, as we began, it's a, it's a relatively new organization, but as we began to do this work, it was clear that there was research that needed to be done in the field that was really missing, that hadn't been done and hadn't been addressed. And as Kate um, has pointed out, you know, all of our funding comes from sponsors. We really wanted it to be an inclusive organization, right? So we made it so that you don't have to pay dues to belong. Well, however, to do research, it does require money. So, um, so anyway, so we can talk more about that in a minute. But I just, I just wanted to point out that we recognize the need in talking to groups like those of you. We realized that this was something where there was a real gap. And so we decided to embark on this research around the code of conduct. So um, you'll see that we have it planned out in various stages, and uh, the green box indicates that that's kind of where we are today, so we have a ways to go. But let me just talk to you about the background and sort of where we're starting from. 
So we're trying to understand, uh, first we did some research around the literature review, right? To figure out what's out there, as I said, and what we're finding is maybe not as much as we were hoping, um, but that's okay because we can be more targeted and we know what we need to do and it helps us define where we need to go with this research. Um, we also wanted to understand the impact of identity exclusion on end users and the approaches that are, are being taken today in the digital identity ecosystem. And, and recognizing even in the short time that women in identity has been in existence, which is only a few years, um, not even five, so uh, there's a lot of progress that's been made. And clearly, uh, companies and organizations are looking at this through a different lens and really trying to, to begin to identify where are some of the problems and the gaps. So understanding those economic implications of exclusion across different markets from both a business and an end user perspective. Um, also trying to create a set of guiding principles that will ensure that all users will um, be able to have a digital identity system that's consistent and provides a high quality user experience. These are kind of a high bar, but this is what we're going for. Um, creating a means by which organizations across the digital identity ecosystem could formally um, adopt an actual code of conduct. So you kind of see these are the different phases. Um, and so, did I, did I miss anything? There we go. Um, so the human element and inclusivity is key. If we don't find, first resolve the human problems, I don't think that technology will help us. So one of the things that we discovered is that some, especially in this first round of research, is that um, some of the solutions or some of the problems we're finding are not necessarily about what kind of technology we own or we put together. So it's it, understanding the depth and the breadth of the problem uh, in some ways has been very eye-opening. Um, why this matters? So as, we've, as Kate said, you know, we are titled Women in Identity, but in truth, we're looking at diversity of all kinds, all shapes, all colors, all everything. Um, and, and therefore, identity and digital identity in particular has to be, um, has to take that into account. And we often use the term intersectional because typically we're not just one thing, right? I'm not just, you know, a woman. I have a certain background. Um, people who uh, may be someone who's in a wheelchair and disabled has other things about them, right? So we have all these facets about ourselves. And so digital identity really needs to be intersectional and it needs to represent everyone who might be wanting to use the identity system and given the global nature of our economy um, and of our nations, uh, it's clear that that is to the point where every, every person needs to be able to be part of that identity system. We tend to solve for our own problems. So what we have seen is that, you know, we tend to focus on what we know. That's the easiest place to start. And the issue with inclusion is that if we could include people that will be using the solutions and we build it with teams that design and test it to help mitigate that bias and help solve problems for real people, we're more likely to come up with systems that are sustainable and resilient and really meet the needs. Too often systems that we build fail because the people that we're building them for were either not part of the process, we've built them for uh, people who, where we've actually built in blocks by accident perhaps, but to where they can't, they are challenged in being able to access some critical services and there are often unintended consequences. We often um, talk about examples of companies that shall remain nameless, but who started out trying with a, a video app, right? And they designed it and, it and it seemed to work great and people were making their own videos and then all of a sudden some people, every time they made a video, it was upside down. It's like, well, what is the deal here? Turns out the product team was all right-handed people. And when left-handed people went to make a video, it was upside down. Now that is an unintended consequence. There was no malicious act there. There was no intent to not make it available to left-handers, being left-handed myself, I don't take personal front. But anyway, my point is, is that there's often consequences that we haven't thought about, and that's where the inclusion, not just in the solutions and trying to account for that, 
But the, the whole reason for women and identities being is that so that development, um, that whole solution creation process is also inclusive. Because what happens is we inadvertently do things that we don't mean to. Um, and when we have that more diverse uh, group coming together, it makes a huge difference. All right, so before I get started, my name is Melissa, and I just want to do a poll of how many of you are in Women in Identity, or a member. It's not bad. <laughs> Yay. So the code of conduct, how many of you sign a code of conduct in your office, in your work, subscribe to a minimum standard? That's not what this is. So what we're doing, it's kind of misnamed, <laughs> what we're doing is we're putting a code of conduct together across all financial organizations to look at the minimum standard either governments or financial organizations. And so the first thing we did, we wanted to make sure it wasn't um, filled with bias, we wanted to do research. And part of our research looked at four key principles. Number one, this is gonna be around the globe, we had to look at the demographic. So we wanted to look at an emerging market and a mature market when we looked at the study of this. We also wanted to look at the form exclusion took. Too many times we look at the inclusive cases and not the exclusion cases. And so we wanted to talk to people and we wanted to ask them the question, if you're excluded, what should we do to include you? Many times what happens is when there's an issue or a problem, we give it back to the people who built the solution and have them try and solve the problem. The other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to talk to experts and we wanted to talk to them about policies they're setting, standards they're setting, products they're building. And people like me, I also work at RBC, who buy products. Too many times, I don't put in my RFPs questions around inclusion. And so we wanted to do that in our study and in our research. And then finally, at all steps of our journey, we wanted to look at our end goal, which is to put a code of conduct together that included inclusion and diversity. And so if we flip to the next slide. So what did we do? Well, we picked two markets. We picked um, Ghana as our emerging market and UK as our um, mature market. And so we conducted a series of interviews, and all these interviews are on YouTube, so in our Women in Identity channel, if you wanna go and watch the, um, the interviews. But what we learned was there were some differences in the um, geographic specific areas, but there were a lot of similarities. In fact, what I was shocked by when, when I saw this was that the UK actually had the most cases of exclusion when we did our study. And so some of the big highlights that we found were things like, what, was, what were you gonna provide for identity verification? Well, what happens if somebody doesn't have a document to provide? And the example in one of our interviews was an individual who had to create a bank account to get a job, but he didn't have a birth certificate. And he didn't have a birth certificate because he was a foster child. And through the foster care system, they lost his paperwork. And so nobody knew the exception process, nobody could navigate him through it. And then finally, the only way he could get a bank account was to get a birth certificate. Well, in order to do that, he couldn't afford the birth certificate because the whole reason that he wanted to get, um, to do everything was to get a job. And so it just became this endless loop. And so the second thing that we did was we went to the experts, policymakers, people who build products, government organizations, and we started to ask them, what were you doing when you built these solutions in both these geographic regions? So what did we learn? If we go to the next slide. There were five key principles that we learned that are forming the foundation of our code of conduct. The first thing is that um, the user is the center of the ID ecosystem. And we heard this in Andre's keynote the other day. We need to think about the individual. Of course, all of us have many IDs across um, many organizations, but it's the individual that matters. The second thing that we learned was it's not one size fits all. And so we have to consider the customer journey. In one of our interviews in Ghana, we talked to an individual who was trying to access money from her bank account. She is part of the 2S LGBTQ plus community and she was in the process of transitioning. And so when she went online or she went into the, the bank, her ID didn't match what she looked like. And so she was blocked from taking out money from her bank account. Not only was she blocked, she was blacklisted. And then we went so many miles away to the UK and we looked at similar scenarios, it was considered fraud in what they were doing. And so they weren't able to actually transact with the organization. The third area was we need to reduce the burden of identity on the user. We need to start looking at vouching, proportionality, KYC, leverage government data. The fourth area is we need to account for identities extended networks. 
So when we talk about an individual and we look at a person, what about delegation? So another interview we conducted was um, an individual who's on the neurodivergent spectrum, and she's not able to interact on her own with the bank. It causes too much anxiety. And so she had to bring her caseworker in to help vouch for her to navigate through the system. You know, I think about personal examples as we go through this journey and as we learn. My father-in-law has Alzheimer's. He's in a late stage of Alzheimer's. And so his son, my partner, goes into a bank and goes through the tedious process each time he's trying to take money out to vouch on behalf of his father. So there are a lot of cases of this. The last area is diversity needs to start at design and be part of the entire life cycle. So we need to get the customer journeys. We need to test it um, with our customers to figure out how we're gonna be inclusive of everyone. And if we don't do that, and we go to the next slide, what is the impact of that bias? Well, if you've ever attended some of our Women in Identity sessions, you hear us talk about the fact that if you have no ID, you have no access. And a lot of our digital systems rely on government identification. Well, if you don't have it, you're not actually able to get access to systems. Another one we talk about is the algorithmic bias. So a number of false positives that happen in biometric systems for people of color. And then we also talk about things like racial bias. And so there are many examples of racial bias we talk about when we're, uh, I, you know, we, we mention a number of them in our sessions around registering identities and the, the, the issues that occur there. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Kay to talk about the next steps. So, <clears throat> The next steps, um, so this is sort of what, what Melissa has done very well, is explain to you the research so far and the findings we've had so far, right? And now we wanna build on that. And so the next thing, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, is the next stage will be to look at the economic impact of that identity exclusion. So not just, we sort of started with how do you access the services at all if you can, now we're looking at, okay, so if you can't, <laughs> if this is somehow blocked, how does that affect you economically? And, and we want to start to begin to, do, to look at that and to get the end user perspective, but also the business perspective. How is that impacting those who are trying to provide those services when they are struggling also? And some other sessions today have talked about um, some of the, the challenges that we're facing in trying to be inclusive and making sure that you know, we can reach everyone in the market, if you will. Um, then in stage three, that's where we hope to put together, based on all of this research and on that foundation, um, a, a set of guiding principles um, and that we hope will help all users of digital identity systems have that consistent high quality experience but that those guidelines, that code of conduct development, that we're gonna be able to pull some things together and I think that that's where we'll also look, all of you who've decided to become members and others which we hope will, um, you know, look for that input about what do these guidelines need to cover to make sure that they're really robust and helpful and agile. Um, and then the last stage will be creating a means by which organizations across the digital identity ecosystem can formally adopt the code of conduct principles and abide by those. So we're looking at some type of an implementation framework. We've had a lot of different conversations, I certainly have, about what that, what that might look like, but um, we're really hopeful that if we can put together a set of really robust guidelines, that it will be something that people can adopt and make use of and that they'll begin to see real change in, the own, in their own solutions and what they're developing and the experience that their end users are having. So at this point, um, I'd really like to talk to you a little bit about how you could help if you're interested in that and I hope that we've sort of piqued your interest so you might be, uh, be willing and, and up for doing a little bit more. Um, one of those is to share this information. Um, all of the, the YouTube videos and everything that we've talked about, the research that we've done, it's all available online. If you go to our website, you would be able to access all of that. Um, and we certainly encourage you to share that content across your own channels, um, in, in your own organizations. And that could include, you know, the organizations where you work. It might also include other organizations that you're involved in. There are a lot of other groups like Women in Identity that are represented here at the conference. So we would encourage you to share that with them as well. And, and what we hope is that we'll continue to be able to have these kinds of discussions um, so we continue to move forward. 
Um, then this, our second circle there is to collaborate. Um, we're moving in the direction, obviously, of developing the code of conduct itself. So we are really interested in collaborating with industry partners as much as possible. And we think that the more that we can uh, involve and collaborate with others, the more likely it is that this will get adopted, right? So that once the principles are put together, if we can be inclusive in our process of doing that, what we hope is that it will feel like the identity ecosystem community sort of owns those principles, right? It's not just us but hopefully we will all come together and then we really hope that that will lead to the, the actual implementation and adoption by many, many organizations. And then the last thing is, is a shameless pitch for sponsorship. Um, uh, we, st we are still doing fundraising in order to do these other steps um, and all of those things, as we said, take money and um, as I'm sure many of you know, when you sort of believe in the mission of a nonprofit, like all of us believe in the mission of women in identity, we want to try to be supportive. And one of the ways that we have to try to do that, do that is to try to find ways to, to sponsor and, and, and consider doing that as part of pushing this research forward. And we would really, as I said, we want to collaborate, but we really also want your help in trying to get us to that finish line, to a place where I think everyone can really benefit. So here are some of the resources that we have available. I mentioned this before. M most of the things that we have listed here are going to be things that are on our website, uh, womeninidentity.org. Not hard to find. Uh, so we have, uh, we have press releases and blog posts. Those are constantly being updated. Um, there are new pages just for that on our website. All of the YouTube videos that we talked about, and there are quite a few. I, um, I know others have actually used those in some of their own presentations or to share with others because they're really, um, I think, very poignant. They're very, uh, you really get a sense about what that human impact is in a way that if we just gave you facts and data, I don't think it would really share it. So it really, they're really meaningful. They're there for you to take a look at and to play and to share. Um, and there's a playlist there of all of our human impact videos. And then, of course, is the actual report where if you do need the data and the facts and you want all of that, and I would encourage you that that's very useful as well. Um, sort of what we hope we've done is put together a whole package. So there's articles and blog posts, there's the actual videos, and then there's the report that really goes into the detail and helps document. So then you get a much better sense for what are the instances that we're talking about, what, are the, you know, what, what is the experience that we're seeing in a more uh, data-focused way. So all of those are free and available to you online. And I'll turn it over to Kate. Thank you, Melissa and Kay, for that um, wonderful overview of the code of conduct research. Um, again, thank you all for being here today. And again, hope that this has piqued your interest in the work that we're doing. Um, and that uh, we're able to continue this work. So as Kay mentioned, you can follow us, or uh, we have our YouTube channel, womeninidentity.org is our website. Check it out. If you're not a member, I encourage you to go there and join the organization. You'll get um, a newsletter, and I'll keep you up to date on all of the activities that we have going on. Um, it's a lot of great, useful information and a great community of uh, volunteers and members. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, the majority of our activity happens on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at info at womeninidentity.org. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. And, and thankfully, Lorraine has offered to help us with the microphone. So if you have questions, we would really, we would really love to have a discussion with you. And, and uh, I mean, we're focused obviously on the code of conduct today, but if you have other questions, I'm pretty sure between the three of us, we can probably answer. So we would really love to hear from you. Sort of. <laughs> Don't I'm not quoting it, so advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. Um I'm hoping that the government can at least kind of codify how that how that research can like put that into practice mm -hmm. for anybody who is a member population. Um have you from any agencies or any other organizations reached out to you prospectives for that EO? And if so, is there a way that you I have. Sometimes you have so much information to find out who you think should be considering 
Uh, well, I'm, uh, I will tell you, I'm based in Washington, D.C., so I work with a lot of federal agencies, in fact. Um, but part, most of that is with my day job. This is kind of a nice place where my day job and my volunteer work, you know, the stuff I believe in, um, all kind of runs together. Um, I'm not sure that I can tell you that I think any federal agency has the answer. I don't think anyone does. That said... What I'm finding in multiple agencies is that this is an issue that's sort of permeating on lots of different levels. So, um, I mean, here we're, we're really talking specifically about identity, but what I'm seeing is that a lot of agencies, based on that executive order, are really looking even beyond that, right? Their procurement processes, all kinds of things that they've really, um, they're even looking at some of their publications, the reports that they usually do. I mean, it just really, I think that the executive order is written so broadly that it's really forced the agencies to do that. I also have the sense there's a lot of pressure on federal agencies to not just comply but show that you're really doing something meaningful. So I'm just telling you what you already know. Um, and I'm happy, you know, maybe offline if you want, I can talk to you about some of the agencies that I've talked to about this. Uh, but I think everyone is looking for the same kinds of things that you are. We, I think, would potentially have some resources, or at least be able to have a discussion if you're interested. And, and uh, if you look at a lot of the different leaders in women and identity, there are definitely people who could help out. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add is uh, if you give us your contact data, we have over 2,000 members. And one of our members um, spoke to the US Congress around um, diversity, inclusion. And so we have different members. We'll just poll our community, and we'll get more information for you. I think that's the best way to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Good question. And thank you for being able to say all that about what that, I, I was afraid you were going to ask me, what did the order say? <laughs> I would fail that test. Any other questions? Is there like a timeline of any sort when they go to fund it and release their draft of it? Absolutely. So 2A has already been released. 2B, we're starting, I think, now, and we're looking for sponsors. We look for sponsors, I think, for each of the phases. So the a sponsor of 2A doesn't necessarily need to be the sponsor of 2B. And I believe the entire thing we're trying to finish by the end of the year. I think we listed it in quarters, but I don't, between the bank and this, I don't know which would quarter is calendar or not. <laughs> so sometime near the end of the year. For the code of conduct itself, we pick the financial services industry and the government. So we're looking at those two, and it's really based on demand. So we have a lot of government organizations approach us and ask us for assistance, especially during the pandemic, because many governments are putting forward a digital identity. And so based on that, we scope down our research just to those two areas, and it's already so vast. People are asking us questions of why do you only pick two countries, and there's just so much to do and so much to uncover. And I think our code of conduct will evolve. So we'll put something forward, but we have to be agile enough to change it over time as we learn through the process. So the code of conduct research does not focus directly on that remote work and the impacts of it. 
Um, so for the code of conduct, like we said, the report that was just recently released was looking at the, the human impact of identity exclusion as it relates to financial services. So, but we do, um, our organization does offer a job board to help with those because we do, we have a lot of our sponsors, um, that's something that they've discussed, they've talked about being able to build those diverse teams and promoting that, uh, we have our job board so that we welcome them to put their jobs on the job board online to be able to reach out to all of those, you know, all of the people around the world who could be potential candidates for them so that they're not looking just directly in their, their um, local area. And maybe I'll just add something just from my personal experience being part of the network. Um, what you find is some organizations are not allowing you to work um, in different areas, not flexible enough. And so what we're finding is people are contacting us saying, are there other jobs? Are there that flexibility? And so we're a community that tries to um, provide opportunity. And so we find people moving around. And so I know at least at RBC, we have a number of jobs that were open and they've been staffed through word of mouth and through the network. We're open to hiring anywhere across the globe. And so we're just making that open to everyone. We also have forums where people can post and ask questions. And so by being a member and just joining the community, we're helping support that. But we're seeing, we, we haven't actually done research specific to that, we're just learning it through people's feedback. We're, we're learning and evolving through this process. So one of the questions we got asked last week in one of the events we did was um, for those who are neurodivergent, they would like the questions um, for the jobs um, attached to our job board because they struggle through the interview process. So we're constantly adapting and learning as we go forward. Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure why Trump this, but do you have, is there like a data dictionary for categories of diversity? So like rural populations, uh, you know, ethnic diversity, religious diversity? <laughs> great question. Okay. We don't have it, but that'll be on our to-do list because yeah, I think that's a great, um, great idea. It is. I had a discussion just today with someone about why are we called women in identity when we're really looking at all these other, and I was like, and what would we call ourselves instead? women, racial, transgender, I mean, the list is long, right? So it's like, I know, it's a struggle, but, but it's important that we're looking at, at all of those possibilities. But your suggestion is terrific. I'm with, I'm with Melissa, I think that goes on our to-do list. And we'll evolve it. I know when we kicked off the Canadian version of Women and Identity about two years ago, age wasn't part of our, and then we added age. So we keep, we keep updating it. Yeah, with our membership and our volunteers, um, you know, we encourage people um, across, you know, gender, race, ethnicity, all of that, to join the organization. And you know, we reach out to to our members, our volunteers, and we're looking for anybody, you know, whether you're early career, mid career, um, you know, to come in. And we appreciate the perspectives. We get blog posts from our members, um, from our sponsors. And um, yeah, just looking for all of that information to come together as one. Um, you know, we don't get an email from someone and go like, oh, that's, you know, like, you know, we welcome all of it. So if you have an idea, there's no stupid questions. There's, you know, reach out to us. Um, and again, like we say, like women in identity, it's, you know, women leading the charge, but we're inclusive of everyone. I think and, and we actually are also actively recruiting, I would say. So like, so for example, when we first started, we had a very tiny board and it was not terribly diverse, that's changed dramatically. And a lot of that is by being intentional about some of that. Um, and we have a lot of other opportunities for people to get engaged. So like, for example, um, one of the things that we started doing in the pandemic is we started having these coffee calls um, because in the beginning, nobody was used to Zoom and it was great to have a little you know, virtual conversation like if you were still in the office. And the reason I give that example is so for uh, one of them, well, for several since then, but um, one of the people that joined, uh, because you have to be a member because we couldn't just put the public link out. We tried that, didn't go so well. So with the members, um, we had someone who is uh, 
visually impaired is on the coffee call. Um, I, we didn't actually see him, but, uh, you know, but, but he engaged and it was great because we talked a, a lot about his experience and I think that was one of the reasons that he wanted to join. I mean, there was no cost to him and he had the opportunity to talk about, let me just tell you what I went through, you know, for my digital identity stuff. So anyway, and that was someone who invited him to be a member and he said yes. So there's a lot of that, but a lot more intentional trying to, you know, I think, I mean, Kate is relatively new, so she doesn't really know the first board and everything, but I think now it's fair to say that we really made an effort to make sure that we are, you know, we're walking the walk and talking the talk at the same time. Absolutely, yeah. And we consider women in identity a safe space, right? You come in, there's, there's no judgment, there's no just, you know, a safe space to come in, share your ideas, talk about things. I mean, the event that um, Melissa referenced about neuro bleh, neurodivergent talent, um, they had two participants on that, um, both, you know, um, and they were able to share their experiences. Um, I mean, the one participant, Dylan, um, he just talked about how he went to his manager and told him he had these issues and then is helping that organization with their hiring processes, like talking to them about, like as an individual with autism, what struggles, what challenges, and that he's been able to do. I thought it was an amazing session because they were on, they were represented on the panel. Not just talked about, they were there. The only thing I'll add about that is our sponsors often challenge us. And so they ask us to do some of these things. So in this case, it was KPMG and um, Sphere who pushed us to really go in that space. And so um, we're always welcoming those opportunities. Can I just add a, another thing? Um, and I don't know that we really touched on this too much. Obviously, this conference is in the US, and we are very North American-centric here. But women in identity is very global. And to your point about you know people with different backgrounds who you know, it's not safe or whatever. What we find is, um, again, when we're, because we're having mostly virtual meetings, but with people with, in, who are in other countries where the experience is very different than it is here in North America, uh, talking about being safe, but also certain things that we can probably do that they are not at liberty to do. Um, and, I, and if nothing else, uh, what I like about women in identity is I think we're there to support them wherever they are, whatever the situation is. And sometimes it's just nice to be able to talk to someone about, this is really frustrating, but you know, women aren't leaders in my culture. Women aren't CEOs. It doesn't work like that, right? And so we have to sort of recognize that and acknowledge that. And you know, we keep talking. And um, we've talked people through career changes and it's not a formal mentoring kind of program, but there's a lot of that that really happens to try to encourage, even though we have to recognize that not everyone's situation is the same. And as you say, it's not always safe, and sometimes things are just not as possible. They're not in the same place as maybe we are here in the States and in Canada. Any other questions? Uh, 
think it's a really good question. It's a question I have because I know RBC is going to sponsor the next um, next round. I think that it, there's a debate, right? Whether you want to do the same regions to under, follow the story all the way through or you want to mix it up. And I think that's all part of a decision we're going to make in that next wave. But we haven't, I don't, to my knowledge, we haven't finalized that decision. Is that decision based on sponsorship that you're going to get or just looking at what the next logical step is? You probably have to repeat that. Cause so the question was, is the decision based on the sponsorship that we're getting or the next logical step? And I think that um, we'll have a discussion around it, but I don't actually know the answer to that question. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for attending, and we hope you will join us um, in the Women in Identity team.